Welcome to the Davidson IFRS update presented over Zoom. I am Craig Jackson, an audit principal with Davidson & Company. Just a couple of notes before we get started. This session is being recorded. If anyone experiences IT issues, try to restart your device and re-log in. If that doesn't work for you, we can make the presentation available to you afterwards so you will not miss your PD. If you have any questions during our presentation, please ask these using the question and answer function in your Zoom window. Questions can be sent anonymously using the question and answer function. If you prefer to email questions, these can be sent to events at davidson-co.com. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker, Arez Bahar, has been with Davidson and Company since 1999 and is a leader of our firm's public company audit practice. And now I give you Arez Bahar. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arez Bahar, and I'm the audit partner here at Davidson and Company. I'd like to welcome you to our IFRS seminar that we normally do in person, but not this year, for the reasons why we all understand why we don't do them this year. So normally around this time of year, which is about a day or so before Halloween, you all come to the Four Seasons, which is now closed, and you would do a seminar in person. And historically, we've had you know a couple hundred people do that. And this year, we can't do it in person. And so, and here I am sitting live at the Davidson & Company headquarters, also in the forest, but we are on the 14th floor of 609 Granville. So we are indeed downtown, but there's just a limited number of people here who are gonna to present today on our annual IFRS update. And so we thank you for coming uh, on live webinar. Um, you know, there's a few housekeeping items as well. Just so you know, if you have a question, there should be a little bit of a sidebar where you can type it. Um, you could raise your hand as well and ask a question. And then at the end of the seminar, um, we will pose the questions to the various speakers and then we will answer your questions. Um, if anything else follows up afterwards, you can always feel free to contact us at any time. So welcome to our annual IFRS update. So what's going on in IFRS? It's been, it's been a year or so since we've done this and, uh, and what's new and exciting. And so what we did today, uh, we have a special guest from the Securities Commission, Mike Moretto, who many of you have seen here before in our annual presentation. And so we thank Mike for coming back again. And we have a host of speakers from our partnership that will go on to various topics. What you're gonna find uh, overall is that under IFRS, there's a, a whole lot of nothing going on and yet a whole lot of a lot going on at the same time. So here's what we'll do today. Uh, first off, we're gonna have our partner guy, Thomas, give the overall IFRS update about what's new and exciting and what's the same and what's not. Afterwards, we'll be joined by Peter Meloff, our assurance partner on an IFRS viewpoint summary. And what the viewpoint summary is, is the IFRS committee meets every once in a while and they discuss lots of topics and they present a viewpoint on it. And so Pete will talk about some of that. Then we'll be joined by Catherine Tai who will talk about the critical audit matters in the new audit report. And so many of you have seen the old audit report, which was a few years ago, which used to be just one page. And many others have seen that since that, it turned into two pages. Well, guess what? The audit report will continuously get longer and longer and longer. And why does that matter to you? It matters to you because the audit report this year we'll go on to critical audit matters, which Catherine will get into in a moment. And then we're gonna be joined by Carmen Newman, who's gonna talk about the COVID-19 and then the reporting and accounting impact that it has for a lot of public companies, some of the disclosures that we're seeing, some of the disclosures that should be there and any impact on your business and how you should consider doing that from a financial reporting standpoint. After that, we'll be joined by Mike Moretto, who's gonna give us the British Columbia Securities Commission regulatory update and he'll sort of talk about what's going on at the Securities Commission. Uh, he'll talk about how the extensions went this year and the pluses or minuses um, and everything else that's going on in that world. And then last but not least, we're gonna be joined by our valuations partner, Mark Weston, who's gonna be talking about estimates and judgments. And as many of you know, estimates and judgments have become a very critical part of financial statement reporting, as well as the auditor obligation. Subsequent to that, once we get through all the speakers, we will do our Q&A session. 
So again, if you have a question, please type it in and we will do our best to answer it. And if we have a little bit more time afterwards and we'll engage in some sort of a panel dialogue. And so that's the agenda for today. And so I would like to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, our partner Guy Thomas, who many of you have seen in here before annually do this seminar and, and we're fortunate to have him join us again and give the overall IFRS update. Thank you, Riz. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the IFRS update. So today I'm going to give you a brief history on kind of where we've been, uh, what's happened in 2020 in terms of IFRSs, which is virtually nothing, uh, except that there has been a whole lot of guidance that has come out uh, to help us along with the existing IFRSs. So the recent history, 2018 introduced IFRS 15 revenues and IFRS 9 financial instruments. And in 2019, we got leases. So 2020, nothing. Going back to IS, IFRS 15, it really gave us a five-step model and that five-step model Okay, it was a contract, you had performance obligations, a transaction price, uh, match the transaction with the performance obligations, complete the obligations and record revenue. Then IFRS 9, financial instruments, the big change there was really it gave us three classifications for assets, that being fair value through profit or loss or other comprehensive income or amortized cost, which was really uh, Principal, uh, primarily principal and interest payments. It uh, also gave us the expected credit loss model for accounts receivable and various other receivables. Now IFRS 16, that gave us one model for capitalization for everything but insignificant leases, meant more calculations, reconciliations, a bigger balance sheet and lots of cash flow or non, pardon me, non-cash transactions, as well as updated disclosures. A lot of people felt like they got run over. This fortunately is a prop. Um, IFRS 16 leases, the big deal here on an ongoing basis, uh, aside from just how to measure is, and I'll get to the uh, remeasurement in a minute, but to measure a, a, a lease, you've got to have a term, you've got to have payments, determining a discount rate can be your challenge, and then calculating a present value calculations. The remeasurement is where the difficulties come in. If there's a change in a lease term, an assessment of an option uh, purchase, residual guarantees, uh, indexes, you get to change your liability, you get to change your asset and potentially a P&L loss for each of these. They're considered modifications. You remeasure. And the remeasurement then has to be broken down into whether it's a separate lease accounted for separately. That's to say, if your lease scope is increased, you got big more assets to use and commensurate liability or not a separate lease, but it still may change some of your assumptions in terms of your liability and your ROU asset and potentially P&L effect. <clears throat> so ongoing for leases, watch out for those changes in the lease term. Watch out for embedded leases. Don't forget that every time you've got a contract, you've got to review it to see if you've got a lease within it. Uh, and you've got separate impairment considerations because assets are measured differently. And you've got, watch out for subleases. So in 2020, no new IFRSs, but there are some big amendments. So with respect to the amendments, effective January 1 of 2020, we have the definition of a business under IFRS 3. Uh, there's an interest rate benchmark reform, and that's really IBOR replacing LIBOR, and I'll get into that in a minute and the definition of what is considered material. Then in the middle of 2020, effective June 1, uh, there was some COVID relief offered uh, rent relate for rent related concessions. Again, is it a modification or not under IFRS 16? So I'll get into these in a minute. Uh, IFRS 3 with respect to the business combinations, it's really a new approach and it allowed for more uh, acquisitions of companies to be defined as an asset acquisition as opposed to a business. Uh, it reduces some of the measurement complexities if it's considered to be a purchase of an asset. 
it's normally measured by the consideration provided. Whereas if it's a business, not only do you have to measure the consideration, but you also have to measure the value of the assets acquired and that can involve valuators and the like and lots of assumptions. Uh, changes the evaluation process to include inputs. That is to say, really now you need an organized workforce to be part of a business and your processes are substantive. That is, they can be completed on their own. You no longer consider whether the market participants can make it work or if they have the ability to reduce costs. And there's an interesting one here an op on optional concentration test where if substantially all of the fair value of gross assets acquired is concentrated in a single identifiable asset or group, uh, then it's not a business. And I have seen this used several times. So keep it in mind when you're doing your assessment of it, whether you're acquiring a business or an asset. As to IFRS 9, this is the financial instrument change, IBOR versus LIBOR. Uh, LIBOR is being phased out. I think they had a little problem with the investment community, some fixing of rates, and so LIBOR was taken away. It's being replaced with LIBOR. What does this affect? Primarily hedging, uh, where a lot of contracts are based on or refer to LIBOR. Now it will be referring to IBOR. Uh, the relief is that the cash flows are considered to not get altered on that change from LIBOR to IBOR. Amendments to IS-1, this is the definition of material. Really affects your financial statements in a general concept. Uh, information is material if omitting, misstating, obscuring could reasonably be expected to influence the decisions that the primary users make. What does it mean? Clean up your financial statements, remove the obscuring and the confusing disclosure. IFRS 16 amendment, this is the June amendment that I mentioned, uh, it's COVID and it's related to the rent concessions specific to COVID. It's a practical expedient uh, and it really allows you not to affect the right of use asset. The changes will instead be to the liability and P&L, but there are some requirements to this. The first one is it is related to COVID and it has to also meet three criteria those being revised consideration usually has to be less. Uh, it goes out to June 30, 2021, and there's no substantive changes to the other terms. So it's just with respect to concession. Uh, the IFRS discussion group referred to as the IDG has put out a fair amount of guidance on this. IFRS amendments, that are effective in 2022. So these are, are passed by the ISB, the International Accounting Standards Board, but have yet to be passed by the Canadian version of the uh, Accounting Standards Board. Uh, there's an annual improvement process, uh, onerous contracts, proceeds before intended use, and I think that one's gonna have an impact, so I'll go through that, and business combinations on a conceptual framework. Uh, the annual improvement process breaks down into four components. Um, one is for uh, cumulative translation adjustments on subsidiaries. Another is a 10% test on derecognition of financial liabilities. Uh, and that's really to exclude third party fees in doing the calculation in the 10% test. An illustrative example in IFRS 16 and agriculture for valuation purposes, uh, inclusion of a taxation rate in the cash flow forecasts. Uh, the big one I see here is the uh, PP and E, the proceeds before intended use. And this is gonna have an impact on the mining industry, particularly those in a development stage. Uh, basically what it is, is when you have incidental revenues during the uh, commissioning stage of a mill, that incidental revenue used to be <coughs> uh, credited against the cost of the asset being built, whereas now it's gonna be showing up as revenue. Not only do you record, record the revenue, but you also have to record the related costs. That's, to me, going to be the tricky part. The implications are it's going to be more complex. You're going to have to estimate the related costs. Uh, you're going to have to track inventory, and you may end up with inventory counts. You may want to talk to your auditor about that one. And there's a big potential, in my view, for, for, for negative margins and certainly big swings in your P&L. 
And then we have amendments for 2023, uh, presentation of financial instruments, and that's really to do with current versus long-term on compound instruments and IFRS 17 insurance contracts. I consider these to be both limited in scope. Uh, there are a number of interpretations that have come out from the uh, IFRS Interp Interpretations Committee, IFRIC. Uh, they're listed here. I also consider these to be relatively narrow scope. If, uh, if it does affect you, I would suggest you go and, and take a look at the IFRIC. Uh, there is uh, some more uh, current um, topics discussed with the, uh, through the IFRS discussion group, the IDG. They meet three times a year. They have reports on webcasts as well as written. It's searchable and uh, it's not authoritative guidance, but it is hugely relevant and very often more timely than the rest of the, uh, the IFRS is because they go through a lot of committees. There's a ton of information here on IFRS 16 leases and how to account for it. So they're dealing with some of the issues that came from that as well as a number of other areas from financial instruments right down through to uh, asset impairments. And lastly, they did a fair amount on COVID and uh, the effects on impairment, expected credit loss models and the like. Uh, and COVID will be addressed a little bit later by uh, Carmen Newham, Newham. Uh, and so I'll leave that for, for Carmen. Additionally, another source, viewpoints, uh, mining. There's four of them that came out. Uh, there's two in mining, uh, one of which relates to business combinations. The other relates to metal streaming arrangements. So um, the other two that came out relate to cannabis. Uh, overview of value considerations for biological assets and cannabis stages of growth, growth and post-harvest activities. Uh, that will be addressed by Peter Maloff uh, as part of this discussion as well. As to exposure drafts coming out, uh, there's six of them. Really the last one is the one that I have interest in. It's IS1 general presentation and disclosures. This is gonna have a big impact. It's, it's a little ways away, but it's coming. There's gonna be defined impacts on, or defined subtotals on your P&L. So profit and loss statement is gonna have defined subtotals. You're gonna have operating income or loss, income from integrated associates and JVs, investing activities and financing activities. So a little bit more in line with what we typically see in a cash flow statement, that's coming through on your income statement. You're also gonna have within the financial statements a note on non-GAAP management performance measures uh, to be disclosed as part of the financial statements. That's, it's relatively defined and I'm sure will be refined, but, uh, but that will become part of financial statements as well. And there will of course be more disaggregation of information. And this was uh, closed for comment on September 30. So it's coming soon. Uh, research projects ongoing, extractive industries, uh, goodwill and impairment and business combinations. The other I think are again, relatively narrow scope. So research projects continue. The big trio of IFRSs, they got through. Now we're going through interpretations and other projects. Uh, other considerations that are notable for you uh, will be the audit report change. We are going to be referring in our audit reports for TSX filers for years beginning on or after December 15th of 2020, something we call CAMS, which is Key Audit Matters. Uh, and that will then in 2022 be inclusive for TSX and CSE filers. So they get a little uh, exemption for the time being. Uh, and can't, key audit matters really are identifying what we consider to be significant risk matters. And in our audit report, we'll identify those as well as uh, hopefully in relatively short form, how, that, how those risks were mitigated. Other considerations for you? Uh, will be COVID related changes for sure. Uh, you'll need to provide your auditor with more information on controls over financial reporting. What did you do to, to improve or, or make sure that your financial reporting was running smoothly? Uh, prevention of fraud. Now you have potentially fewer segregation of uh, duties within your employees. Uh, what did the company do to assess that? So you're gonna have to provide a pretty robust description of what you have done uh, with respect to your controls with relation to COVID. Also access to information, is it limited, is it not? 
and what changes did this have on your estimates and potential impairment considerations. Uh, judgments, uh, whenever you've got a choice of policies to use, you're gonna to have to create a position paper to tell us why you chose what you chose, as well as why you didn't choose the other choices that were available to you. Uh, estimates, uh, prepare support documentation for, this, for the assumptions in the audit. And that's gonna be, Mark will go over this a lot more, but uh, really um, as auditors, we are uh, more and more required to exercise what we call professional skepticism. That is to challenge or scrutinize management's estimates and, and make sure they're reasonable in the circumstances. It's a huge key point for both auditors and, uh, and the regulators. And I mentioned CAMS a little bit earlier, Catherine Tai will be going through those. Um, Non-GAAP measures in your MDNA, be careful how these are used. Uh, they need to be clearly defined why they're useful. Uh, and there is guidance coming out on this. And I think Mike Moretto will be briefly addressing this as part of his topic as well. Good sources of information for you. The ISB, IFRIC, IDG, the CSA, Canadian Securities Administrators, and Viewpoints. To recap, uh, keep in mind those recent changes, IFRS 9, IFRS 15, and IFRS 16. The accounting revisions and amendments require constant review. That's what this topic is really about today. And use the available guidance that you have in front of you. Stay safe and stay tuned. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Peter Maloff, and Peter's been a partner with the firm since I think 2001, been, you know, instrumental in terms of building the firm. He belongs to a number of committees within the firm. Uh, man, this is the guy who uh, it's, it's adequate to say he works hard and he plays hard. This is the fit guy that's coming up. Uh, with no further ado, Peter Maloff, you've got some viewpoints coming at this audience. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Guy. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, COVID times, I wore a suit today. I could still put my suit on and wear my pants, right? So obviously, I'm, I'm doing something right, or, or maybe I'm exercising just enough. Okay, so we're going to go over the viewpoints. There's eight of them that were issued. Uh, two in oil and gas, two in mining, two in cannabis, and two in crypto. And interestingly enough, the two in cannabis, uh, Arez Bahar here, who was actually <laughs> you know, a co-hosting, obviously you know him, was uh, was mentioned uh, on the, the committee that uh, issued the cannabis industry ones. And uh, and our own guy, Thomas, was involved in the committee that worked with the CPA Canada to issue the crypto assets sector. Uh, so they should be up here doing this, but uh, the oil and gas and mining industry too. Now there's some overlap with what, gets, with what Guy says, but those are the IFRS that apply specifically to these industries. So that's what we're gonna go over quickly here. I'm going to go through this very quickly. So IFRS 16, as it applies to uh, key recognition considerations for the oil and gas industry, right? There are seven of them there listed. I'm not going to read them because you can read them yourselves. Uh, but some of the IFRSs that apply here, so under mineral lease and surface land use contracts, IFRS 16 contains a scope exemption, and you're all aware of it, especially from the mineral property stuff, leases to explore for or use minerals, oil and gas, natural gas, and similar non-regenerative resources are scoped out. So under lateral pipeline use arrangements, depending on the type of arrangements, they can have a lease, the more control, more likely a lease, master lease arrangements, you gotta bifurcate it, you gotta split it out lease by lease. Short-term leases, nothing unusual there. You got the same considerations that you have with anything. Short-term leases under 12 months uh, are scoped out and low value leases. They don't say what it is, but US $5,000, they're scoped out. Right, uh, identifying leases embedded in service contracts. Guy mentioned that as well. Watch out for that. Uh, lease and non-lease components of contracts. One of the things that they want you to consider. Uh, this could, could be oil and gas too. I mean, mining too. Drilling contracts with both a drill rig and an operating crew. Uh, if the drill rig is portion of the lease, it must be separated from the service portion. Um, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, but it could like an operating crew's got to be separate from the drill rig, right? You can make an election to say it's all uh, part of the same lease, but then your lease costs balloon. Uh, discount rates, that's the last one there, may not be readily available, right? Next one, asset acquisition versus business combination for oil and gas. Notice the mining has the same one. 
so a work with so we could do two at once almost. But business combination quickly, we can go over that, uh, means that ask, why do you care, basically? So uh, assets measured at fair value, goodwill is recognized, acquisition costs are expense, DIT is recognized, and there's lots of disclosure. If you have an asset acquisition, it's slightly different. Assets are measured at cost, there's no goodwill, acquisition costs are capitalized, and DIT is not recognized because of initial recognition. That's a bit of a summary, you guys already know that. The greater progression to development and production, the greater, more likelihood it's a business, right? There's some minimum size for S3, as Guy mentioned. So there's an optional concentration test. Introduction of the, they, they introduce it with the, with the amendments, right? It's made of substantially all the assets are concentrated in a single asset. And you can, apparently you can use judgment if there's a group of assets that are similar. Judgment, it's involved in everything. And now if you're not making that optional assessment, um, you must, you have to do it the old fashioned way. It's changed slightly, but, Inputs, processes uh, are looked at, and then outputs, but uh, include the definition of a business, but I free states that outputs are not required to qualify as a business. So if outputs are not present, more focus on the processes. For example, uh, of a non-producing property that could be classified as a business if it has an organized workforce. It's still classified as a business, even though it doesn't have outputs. Um, they go on to say that basically it's converged with US GAAP, and then the viewpoint contains a decision tree, which could be useful. I could actually show it to you guys, but uh, okay. So next one for mining industry, underground development costs. Yeah, if for 20, that, that was the one that has for, for surface mines, for open pit mines, right? They've never had anything for underground mines. So this viewpoint addresses the same kind of topic for underground mines. Uh, companies, of course, have developed their own accounting policies as they go, but if you need to look at it, there's, uh, there's three items that they list and the challenge is faced, right? So determine which costs qualify for capitalization. There's a good table. It says, here's the activity. Here's what you should think about. Uh, allocation methods and circumstances where there's operating and development costs. How should you allocate that? Common allocation methods, meters advanced, tons extracted or hauled. That's how you allocate it. Third one, amortization of components. Amortize it on a system rational basis. Well, over the expected life for the, or use of the ore body. There's a reference to another viewpoint in there too. Oh, there's other ones obviously on oil and gas. Next one's on the mining industry. Well, well, asset acquisition versus business combination. I don't know why the guys get, can't they do one on extractive industries or something like that. These guys are like maybe like cops and firemen. They can't be in the same room together, but they they it's the same thing. They talk about the same issues. There's some specific considerations on the optional concentration test, though. So you can look at type of commodity, resource classification, geographical location. If you want to take the optional uh, concentration test and saying that it is an asset, not a business, right? Getting to cannabis. Yeah, okay. So the first one on cannabis issued in February 2020, uh, application of IS41 in the cannabis sector. That's a biological asset one. This, this, is, this is a good one. I like this viewpoint just because it gives you an overview of the cannabis industry in total, cultivation particularly, right? Like post pre-harvest, post-harvest, it goes through the steps and it even describes the process as you go through. You know, so you look like you've been, you know anything about cannabis, right? And that lists some specific typical pre-harvest and post-harvest production costs. Uh, and it lists terms too. So at the back, they have a list of terms too, which is, which is useful. I mean, uh, one I like is mother plant. You know, I don't know, obviously everyone knows about the cannabis industry. Mother plant, it's a mother plant. It's not a father plant. The reason it's a mother plant, mother plant has buds. If you take a seed and you grow it up, you might get a father plant. You don't want that. There's nothing more, there's no value there, right? So you have a mother plant, you have buds. So they don't plant it from seed. They take the mother plant, cut a piece off, put it in solution and then go in the sponge and then put it in there. So you have all mother plants, all buds. You don't have fathers, right? Like the mama bee. Yeah, is that right? Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about bees, but <laughs> uh, I guess they have a hive queen. Queen, yeah, they don't have a king. Yeah, they don't have a king. There's no king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a father plant, what a what a waste of time that was, right? Okay, uh, so they, they go through that and bucking too. That's the other one. Uh, it's not defined in there, but bucking is when you cut it. And Dylan was telling me that that's from that's a forestry term, right? So when you cut the plant, it's it's bucking, right? So, okay, so then you talk like you know a little bit about cannabis. There's another one, uh, fair value considerations of biological assets. Obviously the hot topic, right? So pre-harvest stage plants are measured at fair value, less cost to sell under IAS 41. So IAS 41 up until point of bucking, and then it's inventory. Post-harvest stage product is measured at under IAS 2, which is inventory, right? 
So the viewpoint goes over the fair value measurements, and this is Mark's gig, but this is, this is what it says here, right? Three different techniques for determining fair value, market approach, cost approach, which they mention them, but they're not used. It's typically the income approach, which is the fair value based on future cash flow, revenue and expenses, right? Now, of course, it's a judgment. So the judgments that go into that are yield, market price considering the highest and best use, uh, estimated cost to complete. These are all disclosed. They're required disclosure in the estimate. Now, it's a, it's a hierarchy level three investment, and it says, it explains it in there that if you use a hi different hierarchies uh, to, to create one single estimate, you take the lowest one, and then it's a level three estimate, even though some of them are level ones that go into there, right? Level three estimate. Uh, all right, marching through. Auditing crypto assets, relevance and reliability of the information obtained from a blockchain to be used at audit evidence. Okay. This is addressed to auditors, right? This is, maybe you haven't seen it. You'll see it if you come across a crypto company because they're gonna, auditors are gonna show it to you. We'll show it to you, right? Basically says all blockchains aren't, aren't created equal. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but it has some pretty good terms and has some, you know, that we should maybe go over. Some of them are actually pretty interesting, right? So there's public and private blockchains. We only deal with the public ones or private ones, industries use internally themselves, right? Public blockchains, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin, two examples of public blockchains, that's great. I'm gonna go over some other terms they have in there. So they, they talk about a zero knowledge proof. It's a method by which one party can provide another party, uh, can prove to another party that they know the value of something, but they, uh, without, paying the, without telling the actual answer, right? So this is important. So it's, it's the example of, for example, uh, Sudoku or you know the New York Times crossword. So you give it to a class, you say, okay, you guys do the New York Times crossword. And then, and then let me know when you're done. Somebody stands up, says, I'm done. And then they say, well, okay, I don't want you to tell because everyone else is going to know the answer then. Just tell me what the third line down, fourth line in is. And they say, it's letter A. They say, huh, well, that's pretty good. Maybe you be lucky. Maybe you have the whole fourth line in, sixth line down. They say, well, it's the letter Z. Oh, you must have solved it. Didn't tell me the answer, but there's proof that you solved it. Now that's used in proof of work uh, cryptocurrency uh, certification, right? Blockchains have two types of certification, proof of work and proof of stake. The form of cryptographic zero knowledge proof is used by proof of work uh, uh, and certain other amounts of computational effort has been. So in other words, uh, the, they use the zero knowledge when they, there's a computer sitting off in Iceland somewhere and they say, the guy says, oh, I found it. Um, they give him the answer and then the others can very quickly uh, say that, yes, you got the right answer and you must have put in the work because it takes a lot of work to put into that answer. Right? And proof of stake, uh, they're talking about changing some of them to proof of stake. That's a, that's a randomly chosen winner for, uh, for a, a reward on mining a Bitcoin based on the amount of stake you have. There's a lot of talk about that, but uh, auditors need to design uh, procedures based on the characters and the risks of the blockchain. We're okay with Bitcoin, we're okay with Ethereum. When you get into others, uh, they have different characteristics that we have to investigate and test, right? So what could go wrong? You know, invalid transactions, data is not agreed upon in the network, you know, not accurately recorded in the blockchain. That's what's included in this viewpoint is you have to think about what can go wrong. Okay. Uh, and the last one, auditing crypto assets. Do you need to test controls when obtaining audit evidence to support the rights of ownership? Yeah. So that's another one where if you, if a company has crypto assets, uh, you know, and the auditor starts asking you all kinds of questions and they say, well, we're not making this stuff up. This actually helps us. And so we can provide it over to a company and say, yeah, we have to consider all this stuff. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's addressed to auditors, but, um, but it's the, making it clear that you have to understand the internal controls, right? So this is the, the narrow scope of this one, of course, is that uh, it's, it's the ownership assertion and a self-custody crypto asset. So you have to have a Trezor, you know, a hot wallet, a cold wallet that you have yourself right? Uh, and it's got to be on a public blockchain. That's what this scopes, that's what this scoped in here. Factors to consider, of course, is the complexity of the environment, uh, availability of evidence to outside the blockchains. For example, they could be transferred in and out of bank statements, which have a control. So, you know, that supports your assertions regarding the uh, blockchain or the exchange that doesn't have controls, right? The volume of transactions, less risk with little transactions, more risk with more transactions. And then they say, other, right? Uh, always other. So that's all I have for you. I wonder if I did my, <laughs> did I ripped through pretty fast? Yeah. Uh, that's okay. okay. He just ran 10 Ks before he uh, got <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, that, coming after me is uh, Catherine.
Catherine Tai. Uh, Catherine Tai uh, is started out as a CGA, and uh, she all not, all the rules changed. So all of a sudden, Catherine says, "Hey, I can become a partner." Said so we said, "Hey, Catherine, would you please become a partner now?" Uh, and so uh, many congratulations, and uh, Catherine is fluent in Mandarin and Cantonese. Thanks, Pete. Um, actually, a, a comment in my bio is that with COVID, I think I have to amend my bio slightly. I'm adding a new hobby, and that is TV binge watching. Um, well, anyhow, I'm happy to be here and give you a brief introduction on a new paragraph, a new section in the auditor's report um, that is called Key Audit Matters. Since the last economic downturn, attention has been turned to the auditor's report, which had remained largely unchanged for decades. In response to the perceived desire for more information and judgment from auditors, regulators at first internationally, and then in the US and Canada, added significant new requirements and disclosures in the audit reports. They have called for auditors to provide more entity specific and relevant information in the audit reports. Accordingly, new auditing standards for reporting that require auditors to include key audit matters were issued and adopted globally and then in the US and Canada. The international standards have been effective for several years and reporting requirements were already in place in various jurisdictions. For audit reports issued under the US standards, key audit matters are referred to as critical audit matters. For the purpose of this presentation, I will refer to these key and critical audit matters as key audit matter or CAM. As Gan mentioned earlier, CAMs are effective for periods ending on or after December 15, 2020 for TSX filers. There is a two-year deferral to December 15, 2022 for TSX Venture and CSE filers. SEC filers, CAM was already effective for large accelerated filers. While for other issuers, CAM is effective for periods ending on or after 15, 2020. The requirement to report CAM is an auditing standard. You may ask, why is it important for me to understand CAMs? Remember what CAMs do? CAMs are meant to enhance the communicative value of the audit report by offering better transparency about the audit. Investment, investors may, re, may compare the CAMs in the audit reports of companies in the same industry. They may call your investor relations and ask why the key audit matters identified in the audit report of your company are different from the audit report of your peers. Therefore, it is very important for management and audit committee to have a good understanding of CAMs. It is important for auditors management and audit committees engage in communications early in the audit process about the CAMs that are likely to be included in your audit report. So what are key audit matters? Key audit matters are defined as matters that in the auditor's judge professional judgment were of most significance in the audit of the financial statements of the current period. And how are they determined? Matters communicated with the audit committee is their starting point. The judgment-based decision-making decision framework is a two-step process, beginning with a narrowing of the, to those, of the matters to those require significant auditor attention, and then a further narrowing of matters to those of most significance. So we see that as a, as a funnel, funnel approach. Areas in the financial statements that involve significant management judgment, including estimates and significant events will likely be considered as a CAM. We have to bear in mind, CAMs are not meant to substitute the preparer's view of the financial statements or substitute for a modified audit opinion. In a survey of more than 150 auditors reports, the Financial Reporting Council in the UK found that the top five most reported risks can, uh, were impairment of assets, income tax, goodwill impairment, management override of controls, and revenue recognition. It is not a surprise that these are top five key audit matters because these are typically areas of greatest risk for the audit. As auditors evaluating key audit matters, we ask ourselves these questions. 
where were the areas of subjectivity? Which areas required a significant application of judgment? The nature of a CAM will also vary according to the industry sector the company operates in. Revenue recognition is likely a CAM for software companies, but it may not be a CAM for mining companies. The description of a CAM is always required to include a reference to the related disclosures in the financial statements and address two things. Why the matter was considered to be one of most significance and determined to be a CAM and how the matter was addressed in the audit. I just want to quickly show you an example. So in this example, inventory valuation is determined to be a CAM because significant management estimates are involved. The why is addressed under the risk description and the how was addressed in the audit response description. Some additional consideration for you. If the auditor determines that there are no CAM, the auditor will still include a statement to this effect in the separate section of the auditor's report under the heading key audit matter. A material uncertainty related to the entity's ability to continue as a going concern is by nature a key audit matter. However, in these circumstances, the going concern will not be described in the audit, it will not be described in the key audit matter section. Rather, this matter is reported under material uncertainty related to going concern paragraph, which we have right now. Substantial experience in communicating CAMs and audit reports have been gained globally. One message is clear. We should not wait until the effective date to identify and draft CAM. Given the quantity and significance of the changes, implementing a planning process will enable a smooth and effective transition. The process should include the auditor, management, and audit committee, because these parties are key to strong financial reporting and governance. As auditors, we will communicate with you in the audit planning process as to what matters will likely be considered as CAM. We will discuss with you the draft communication of the identified CAM in the auditor's report. We will also discuss any other matters identified by us that could become CAM in the future. For example, a business acquisition completed after the current fiscal period. So this was a brief introduction on what CAMs are. Uh, now I will turn over to Carmen, who will talk uh, about the impact of COVID-19 on accounting and financial reporting. Thanks, Catherine, and good afternoon, everyone. So I was browsing the internet a couple weeks ago, and I noticed the trending topic was matching your face masks to your outfit. I couldn't ha help but laugh to myself and think, oh, how things have changed so much over the last year. As we all have seen, COVID-19 has not only impacted the global financial uh, markets, but also depending on the industry and primary operations of a company, it may have a pervasive financial reporting implications. As we won't have time to get into too much detail, on each topic, the aim here is to make you aware of some of the key areas we are seeing the impact of COVID-19. Some of these are financial statement disclosure, going concern, impairment of non-financial assets, significant estimates and judgments, debt covenants, modification of contracts, and government grants. Starting with financial statement disclosure, as many of you know from disclosing it in your own financial statements, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic in March 2019. Therefore, generally speaking, commencing for December year or period end financial statements, either in note one or the subsequent event note, companies included generic disclosure regarding the uncertainty surrounding the potential impact of COVID-19. For current 2020 filings, financial statement users and regulators will be looking for a more robust discussion on how and if the company was impacted by COVID-19. 
we would recommend companies to keep this discussion in note one and then potentially reference other notes that your impact discussion ties into. Also in note one, if applicable, we often see going concern disclosure. There has been no change to how the company should eva be evaluating going concern. The evaluation should still be based on the relevant conditions and events that are known and reasonably known at the financial statement date. But the key here is that most companies, the factors that are now relevant will have likely changed. Some of the new factors that companies should be considering are temporary seizing of operations, decline in recurring revenue, decline in the value of assets, expected non-compliance with debt or other contractual obligations, lack, lack of access to necessary capital or financing, and inability to access key resources, inputs, or products. A lot of these potential implications will also lead companies to assess whether there are indications or triggering events for impairment of assets. We will not get into too much detail here as our valuation partner will be discussing these items. However, it is likely that COVID-19 will be a triggering event. Several companies may have to accelerate the normal impairment test and assess other assets that generally aren't assessed for impairment. Companies generally focus on goodwill. However, you may also want to evaluate the collectability and expected credit loss on trade receivables, pp e and the right of use assets, inventory, investments, and intangibles. This will also likely lead to revisiting cash flow forecasts and key assumptions being utilized. Management will need to ensure the data is being used as relevant and reliable and assumptions are still appropriate. In addition, discount rates will also likely have to be revisited. The challenge here will be to determine how the decrease in the risk-free rate translates to a decline in the discount rate, something that will likely have to be discussed with evaluator. And finally, companies should consider enhancing disclosure for key assumptions and sensitivity information as there will be new uncertainties and change in risk factors. Next item, uh, item companies may experience due to COVID-19 is breaching debt covenants. These can occur due to a multiple factors, but the key to note here is if the breach occurs on or before the reporting date, it will likely provide the lender with the right to demand payment. Therefore, the liability is classified as current. If the breach occurs after the reporting date, the breach is a non-adjusting event. However, it is still important to make sure that the disclosure includes the current status with the lenders to rectify the breach. In both situations, disclosing the amount exposed and how the company is in breach is important. Another result of COVID-19 is that we have seen many contracts being one modified. One of the main ones here is leases. This is likely from adjusting the frequency of payments, deferring the lease payments with, cat, with catch up clauses, or partial or full forgiveness of certain payment periods. Generally speaking, these are recognized as contract modifications or a separate contract, depending on the type of change. However, as Guy previously discussed, the IISB has issued a new optional practical expedient to leases to treat these rent concessions due to COVID-19 as not a lease modification. As we won't, as he, as he went over, certain conditions must be met. Therefore, in order to utilize this practical expedient, it is important that companies look to ensure that they meet these criteria. We have also seen revenue contracts being modified. Companies are extending payment terms, granting price concessions, or adding goods or services at a discount. In these cases, some of the main things the company must do is reassess the contract enforceability and timing of revenue recognition, update estimated transaction prices for variable considerations, and reassess collectability and allowance for doubtful accounts. 
Finally, we have seen many government grants have been implemented due to COVID-19. The key here to, will be to assess the economic substance of any government grants and determine the appropriate accounting treatment. Specifically, does it meet the definition of IAS 20.3, IAS 20 being accounting for government grants and disclosure of government assistance? The main government grants we are seeing clients receive is the CEWS, which supports Canadian employers by providing a wage subsidy, the CEB, which is an interest fee loan of 40,000, of which 10 is forgiven if 30,000 is paid during a set time frame, and the Paycheck Protection Program loan in the US, which is intended to provide loans to businesses to guarantee eight weeks of payroll and other costs to help these businesses remain viable. The loan can be forgiven if the company follows specific guidelines. All of these grants will be accounted for under IAS 20. However, any tax moratoriums and refunds or income tax regulation changes to stimulus measures likely do not fall under the standard. In regard to these government grants, the main question clients are often asking us are how should these grants be recognized and measured? Generally speaking, government grants are recognized at which the date it is reasonably sure that the entity will comply with the conditions attached and the grant will be received. Therefore, for a company, this not, may not be when a formal confirmation is received, so they may be able to recognize it earlier. In regards to accounting for government grants, this should be consistent with how the expense or cost for which the grants are intended to compensate are recognized. Furthermore, they should be recognized over the period in which that expense is recorded. This means for the CEWS, a company should recognize it as a debit or to cash or receivables and a credit against salary and wages. For the CEB and the PPP loan, the company should recognize as a debit or cash to receivables and a credit to loan. The key for these loans is that the full amount of the loan should be recognized until the company has met all the requirements for a partial or full forgiveness. As this is the first time many companies will recognize government grants, it is, ensure, it is important to ensure that disclosure is important, appropriate. Companies will have to ensure they have an accounting policy, significant estimates and judgments if necessary, as well as a separate note to disclose the details of the government grant. Hopefully we have made you aware of some of the key topics companies see COVID-19 having an impact. We mainly discussed accounting issues about COVID-19, but it is important to also recognize how your audit may change this year. Auditors will need to be performing inventory counts, walkthroughs, gaining an understanding of your controls, as well as organizing our standard audit work. It is important to not only ensure that you are organizing these earlier, but more importantly, the, that the company has appropriately adopted to the changing work environment and that they can demonstrate that all appropriate controls are still in place. We realize many companies have come across different accounting issues around COVID-19 and we have only had a chance to go over some of these. There are several very good resources out there, which we have listed a few here. However, don't, don't forget that DNCO is always here to help you. So even if you're not going through an audit or intern review, please feel free to reach out to your audit team. Finally, hopefully this will not be the new normal for that much longer. As I know personally, as well as our staff here at Davidson, miss interacting with you one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks for the time. And I will now hand it off to Mike to give a BCSE regulatory update. Great. Thanks, Carmen. And uh, thanks to the Davidson and Company team uh, for putting this on and inviting me again this year. It's, <laughs> we all know it's an unusual year. 
the one thing is, is I look out into the room and I just see <laughs> five or six of us that are in the room, which is always a, a disconcerting thing because I think the both from the Davidson and company staff as well as myself, you know, we really look forward to the interaction of this uh, of this event, and uh, we're missing it this year. But uh, let's hopefully uh, uh, stay safe and be able to uh, meet in person next year and uh, uh, go through that uh, exercise of uh, reintegrating and reintroducing uh, ourselves to coworkers and uh, and people, um, uh, clients, and otherwise. It it is pretty odd, but um, that said. Time for a new normal. I think Carmen said it's not time for a new normal. And uh, I'm hoping it won't be uh, too, too long before we do get back to some semblance of doing what we do and, and how we do it. But I imagine that has changed for, uh, for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> so to state the obvious, we're not really in a time of normal, um, but there are a couple of areas that I wanted to cover today just to, uh, to, to give you a regulatory spin on things. Um, I, I wanted to touch base briefly on the COVID-19 from a, from a different lens, not a, uh, simply a, just a disclosure, um, but how we dealt with it in terms of a regulatory response. Wanted to give you a quick update on regulatory burden projects that um, I think I've introduced last year and uh, give you a little uh, uh, sense of where we are with those and then wrap it up with uh, what else is on the horizon, things we're working on besides COVID, besides trying to figure out how to get our staff into the office, uh, those types of things. So in terms of a regulatory uh, response on the COVID-19, I don't really wanna go into the granular here, but I did want to kind of give you a, a bit of a, uh, a a bit of a kind of synopsis of what we what we did in terms of, uh, of changing our regulatory track, and also um, some of the um, observations from that. Um, in terms of the biggest thing that we focused on early on, and um, you know, for some reason I can still remember the day that uh, that uh, our office shut down. It was a Tuesday, it was March 17th. So uh, hoping that that will be back uh, up and running before March 17th of 2021. Um, what we tried to do was really sit back and and try to think about the impact of, of issuers and, and, and companies in this whole unknown. Um, so what we started out with was uh, issuing blanket orders for um, temporary ex extensions. So we ended up issuing three of them um, in succession based on on um, pushing uh, due dates and filing deadlines out. So that was the first big piece. Um, as you can see, it kind of extended through till the end of August 20, August 31st. That was the last uh, blanket order. So essentially that covered, uh, gave issuers filing uh, extensions up until October 15th. So we're kind of through the most of it. Um, <clears throat> we also did uh, parallel ex extension relief as it related to investment funds. So um, in terms of guidance, we tried to, um, uh, throughout the process, put in f uh, frequently asked questions regarding filing extensions um, and how the interaction of different um, filings came about in different deadlines, whether it's AGM, uh, filing of information circulars, not just financial statements and MD&A. So that guidance, uh, we tried to kind of keep a live uh, frequently asked questions uh, document throughout the process. And we also put some guidance out on uh, COVID-19 continuous disclosure obligations. And I think um, probably building on that and building on what Carmen said about you know, kind of how are we going to get there by the next year end, you know, the December 31st, 2020s. Um, I think our aspect on the regulatory side is to try to do an, maybe an issue-oriented review where we go through some of the disclosure that we're seeing on COVID-19 um, for issuers and then try to give some guidance or um, observations before we get to the December 31st uh, year-end filings. So at least issuers will have a bit of a sense of where the regulators are sitting with things. So in terms of kind of what we saw, <clears throat> sorry, shuffling paper here. 
in terms of the reliance on the extension, the general trends, and just to try to give you the insight of, of what it started out to be and, and why we kind of wound down the extension and a, a blanket relief program. Um, you know, my focus and comments are really on calendar year companies. Um, so all the statistics, statistics that I'm going to provide are based on calendar year companies. But, um, you know, I'll preface that by saying venture issuers, 50% uh, of venture issuer uh, companies have um, December 31st year ends. And then after that, not one month makes up more than 8%. So the predominance of venture issuers is uh, December year ends. And when you get to the non-venture issuers, that percentage uh, jumps up to 82%. So you can see that that most of the uh, the statistics that I'll drive through are, are really for the uh, majority of our issuers. Um, when we started off, you know, we put the first um, blanket order out in about the third week of March. And for venture issuers, their annual financial statements for the 2018 calendar year were due uh, April uh, 30th was their first filing. So from that perspective, about 27% of venture issuers across the country use the uh, blanket extension. And then when it got to their Q1s, which were due June 1st, that fell to 21%. And then we found that at August 31st, when their Q2s were done, that reliance was down to 4%. So we kind of got the sense that issuers were, were being able to adapt and, um, and, and work with the situation of, uh, of getting staff in and, and finding ways to get their financial statements done. On the non-venture side, it was a bit different in that the annual financial statements, which were due March 31st, was 6% uh, relying on the blanket order. And then it went up in Q1 to 8%. And then uh, at August 30, August 14th, it was down to 1%. So we're seeing that you know issuers are adapting. I will say though <clears throat> that for issuers that are still having problems because we are really getting into further lockdowns, reach out to us. Uh, we have the ability to use uh, management cease trade orders as uh, in, in um, absence of cease trade. So you know, we don't have extensions, but management cease trade order may be a way to go. And you can explore that with, uh, with my staff or myself. Uh, so certainly I, I put that out there as a, as a, um, a possibility now and going forward. Um, you know, I'm often asked what's gonna happen down the road. Are we gonna think about blanket extensions again? We really don't know. We're, we're as much as we'd love to be proactive on this, I think the world is just changing day by day. And so we're just trying to be a bit uh, uh, as much proactive, but as much reactive. I mean, this week we're seeing a lot of changes around the world. Germany just announced a two week lockdown. I think France is contemplating that as well. And, you know, just to, to, to bring it out there because no conversation goes without talking about the US election, we'll see what happens next week too. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to that being over just so that there's normal TV coming back. I don't know, I just always see how the TV is, is that. So um, switching gears, I, I wanted to update you on some of the various projects that we had underway on uh, burden reduction. So specifically, I always reference six um, six buckets of burden reduction that we've been working on since 2018. Um, first of which is uh, facilitating at the market offerings. Pretty narrow area, but the fixes are very important to those that are in that area. So uh, we made changes to our shelf distribution prospectus rules. Uh, the project goal was really to codify a bunch of ATM relief that we've been issuing over time and really driven by cross-border issuers. So issuers that were looking to offer cross-border had a burden in Canada that they didn't have in the US. So uh, we tried to um, codify some of that relief and the effective date of that relief is August 31st. So it's in play. Um, from all we're hearing, the uh, it, it's, it's uh, a positive response. Issuers are happy to be uh, at least afforded um, the option of uh, an easier offering if they so chose under the at the market offerings. Um, business acquisition reporting, um, something near and dear to my heart because I've been working on this forever. Um, not, not just this burden reduction project, but, but business acquisition reporting. 
um, one of the things that really keeps me employed at the commission. So um, I may have to think about a second life if we get rid of too much of this burden. Um, in terms of the changes to the continuous disclosure as it relates to um, non-venture issuers, we made some changes um, narrowing um, the trigger tests from two to, uh, instead of just triggering one single significance test, you must trigger two and it's at 30%, not 20%. Now that seems very, um, I guess, uh, finite in how we, we, we came up with the, the, the two, two of the three tests being triggered and moving the threshold from 20 to 30. We actually did a lot of data analysis on this and um, that's how we think we've kind of uh, landed in the right spot. Time will tell, but um, to really come up with our approach, we went back and looked at the historical, all the business acquisition reports filed in the last three years, as well as all exemptive relief applications in that same three year time frame across Canada and try to really just use the data to, to, to guide us. That's where we've landed. The effective date is <clears throat> noted at November 18th, 2020. What does that mean in the business acquisition reporting context? And really the trigger of testing business acquisition reporting is on the acquisition date. So if your acquisition date is, is after November 18th, 2020, you'll apply the new rules. Prior to that, you'll use the old rules but certainly if you're caught in that time period between now and, and November 18th, reach out, there could be an avenue to seek relief uh, on, the, on, on those provisions. Um, alternative prospectus model. This is an area where um, we did a lot of analysis as well. Um, we did a lot of consultations across the country and we did a lot of data analysis, all of the prospectuses and private placement offerings in 2017, trying to, trying to delineate where we really should start on this. Um, <clears throat> we use the data as a starting point, but then use the facilitations really to try to get to gauge what issuers wanted and what other stakeholders wanted in terms of, of proposing alternative prospectus models. What we found is that, um, you know, we kind of narrowed our findings down to, to two key projects that we're going to we're going to progress, one of which is a prospectus exemption for smaller public offerings. So an exemption, um, not uh, actually redoing the prospectus itself, but looking at a, an exemption that could be relying on a smaller offering document uh, for the smaller issuers. And then for the bigger issuers, we were um, looking to develop uh, something akin to the well-known season uh, issuer model in the US or WICSI. Um, and under that model, large, large issuers in the U.S. are able to get into the prospectus system um, on a really quick basis through automatic um, acceptance of their registration statements. So the question is, is would we think about doing that with automatic receipts? We don't know if we can really uh, fully explore that, but we'll, we'll work through it and try to put out some proposals and develop some proposals for comment that we goes along those lines to, to tackle some of the uh, burden issues for larger issuers. So a bit of a two pronged model there, one looking at smaller offerings and one looking at big issuers. So the hope there is um, we're just into that next phase of the actual development of the actual proposals. Um, you know, we've got the framework of what we should focus on. Now we're focusing on those and trying to draft uh, potential amendments. <clears throat> Revisiting primary business. I always have to pause here because uh, this project, <laughs> you can look at the goal, harmonize approach to primary business and IPO. Really French for, can CSA get themselves all along the same page across the country? So we've been working on this progress to date, still a bit of a work in progress. Um, we have been impacted and, and are considering some of the recent changes coming out of the US. So we will um, we'll continue to work on that. We think we're pretty close. Um, if anyone has any areas where they're, uh, you know, they're wondering what a primary business is in the context of either a put together transaction or significant acquisitions, reach out. We're, we're always here. We'll, we're happy to talk through it. We just don't have a, a landing spot that we can all um, kind of uh, put out to the marketplace yet, but we're very close. CD requirements, this is probably our biggest area of, 
uh, 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 burden reduction that we were tackling uh, with goals to eliminate duplication and overlap, considering a combining CD documents. And what does that mean? Really trying to get into a, um, a single report. So um, maybe a bit more similar to the US, you know, not really saying that that's where we're, we're going after or trying to target our, our reporting, but could we put financial statements, MD&A, AIF in a single document uh, to reduce any overlap and um, to, to consider them as really a, uh, a single disclosure statement. So um, the progress today has been pretty, uh, we've been working really hard on this. It has a lot of tentacles as we work through different um, uh, disclosure um, ideas. Uh, it hits a lot of instruments. So um, we've got some proposals that are pretty close to to being ready for public consumption. I probably, if I had to guess, I'd say hopefully we can get something out for comment in Q1 of 2021. Um, it's been a bit slow just given all, all that's going on and, and the ability for us just to um, to hunker down and, um, and, and get those uh, amendments kind of polished up and finished. <clears throat> Electronic delivery won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, we had a, um, a consultation paper that we put out earlier this year where we really focused on one area, access equal delivery model. Next steps is we're taking those comment letters, a lot of positive feedback, and we hope to develop uh, proposed amendments for comment. Again, look for those in 2021. Um, <clears throat> next step, really in trying to highlight a couple things, recent publications. I uh, wanted to just give you a, a sense of what we're doing other than the policy side that, that I've mentioned on reducing burden, focusing on COVID, what can we do? Uh, CSA staff notice, continuous disclosure review program says here, stay tuned. I just didn't want to um, miss it. We just don't have it out yet. I think it, look for that in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's normally out by now on our timing. This is really just kind of giving a, a picture of our, our last year. It's a biannual report now. Um, and just through some uh, various reasons, uh, really just political um, elections across the country have just kind of pushed, pushed this back in terms of a uh, of an issuance of the publication, so stay tuned. A big area that we just finished wrapping up on uh, developing proposed amendments is the offering memorandum. So that might be of interest to uh, to issuers who are using the, the OM form and the, the OM exemption. Um, there's a, um, some uh, significant amendments that are, are being proposed, including a specific form for industries, so real estate, and cumulative investment vehicles. So I encourage anyone to take a look at that. I think the consultation period extends to December 16th. So uh, take a look at that. If it has interest, we'd love to hear as much feedback as we can when we put out these proposed amendments. Um, and then a couple other staff notices that are out there uh, for your review and, um, and uh, consumption. In terms of what else is on the regulatory horizon, non-GAAP uh, and other financial measures. I think Guy mentioned this. Um, <clears throat> we'd put our non-GAAP measure uh, proposals out for second comment early in 2020. Um, comment period um, ended the end of June. So we're just uh, digesting those comments and I would say look for uh, a rule, hopefully um, a final rule, not a another rule for comment. Um, in first half of 2021. Uh, we're also continuing work on investment funds burden reduction. And the last thing is the National Systems Renewal Project. I kind of bring that up every year. Um, that is the rework of CDAR, which is now targeted to be called CDAR Plus. Um, and um, thankfully there's no one in the room, so I won't hear the gasp when I say we are targeting implementation uh, in December, 2021. Uh, I think last year I put that out there and people were like, it's a website. How hard is it? Um, it is not really the website that, that it, because it's a filing repository, it's really getting the data and being able to direct the data into the, into the right, um, into the right um, online facilities and being able to track things. So 
and that's also hurting all jurisdiction to have their um, uh, filing um, systems internally aligned to have that go live in uh, 2021. So that's it. Um, my contacts always there. Uh, reach out. Uh, you know, when I, I, I often say, when in doubt, reach out. We're always here, um, and we're always willing to uh, to take the questions or try to work through uh, issues that uh, issuers or other stakeholders have. So please do. I'll I'll go past the questions because we'll hopefully pick up those at the end. So without further ado, maybe I'll introduce Mark Weston. Uh, a, a valuation specialist here at Davidson and Company, um, and uh, you know Mark is a CPA and a and a chartered business evaluator. Does a lot of work both at the Canadian side and the international side, and um, he's a he's a speaker at the commission as well. So he helps out with uh, he's helped out uh, our enforcement group in terms of having them learn a little bit more about the valuation in the cannabis sector and stuff like that. So. Um, Welcome, Mark, and uh, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Could you go back to that picture for a sec? Look at that, eh? That's a good picture. I got a smile on there. No one believes me. That's a smile. That's a, that's a good, serious valuation type picture. Anyways, thanks. Moving on here. Estimates and judgments. Okay. What are the characteristics of a well-supported judgment? or a well-supported estimate. It all begins with a story, a narrative, a tale. I'm gonna give you some examples of true life stories that I've been involved in. And uh, this will be in the context of a purchase price allocation. So typically I'll go to a client and I'll say, so tell me, you bought this company. What was the process? Here's a bad story. Well, we bought the company because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, in a lot of cases, that may be the actual story. In fact, I've talked to some people. Uh, one particular, I remember it was a distillery and I was actually in Jamaica. And the question here was simply, so why'd you buy this distillery? He said, well, you have to ask the big guy. Finally made it up to the big guy. Why'd you buy it? He says, I've always wanted a distillery and it seemed like a good idea at the time. So that was in fact, the reason. From an auditor perspective, not a good story. What would a better story have been? We bought this company to acquire its portfolio of brands. It's a bit better. It's a bit better. What would even be better? We bought the company to acquire its portfolio of brands and Bob. Bob's the guy, you know, the guy, Bob. It's the rum guy, he knows everything. As soon as you acquire Bob, things are sealed. That's good. Not quite good enough though. What's even better? What's the best one? What's the one that's gonna make my partner Rez here or a guy in the back or Pete, what's gonna make them happy? More importantly, what's gonna make a regulator happy? How about this type of story? We bought the company too. Number one, acquire its portfolio of brands which helps to diversify product reliance risk and is more attractive to lenders. So that's a good story. That's a good story. Two, we bought the company to acquire a talented, irreplaceable workforce that results in competitive efficiencies and lowers costs. That's good. That's good. How about this? We bought the company to realize unique synergistic revenue growth by cross-marketing to each other's customer base. Now, when I originally talked to Mr. Rich Guy, and I said, why'd you buy it? And he said, it seemed like a good idea at the time. The fact is, that's why he bought the company. He just didn't have the story. Now, let's think about it. Come year end, and we're trying to support a whole bunch of Goodwill, and Goodwill isn't bad. Goodwill's not bad. Goodwill's not automatically impaired. Goodwill simply results from intangible assets that don't meet the criteria of IAS 38. They're not identifiable. So let's look back here. What components of the story might support Goodwill? They acquired a talented, irreplaceable workforce that results in competitive efficiencies and lower costs. Well, there you go. Workforce by definition is included in Goodwill. It's not an identifiable intangible asset. That workforce can be quantified. It can be valued. 
What about the fact that you're going to have competitive efficiencies and lower costs? Well, those competitive efficiencies and lower costs are going to support goodwill as well. Goodwill is not bad. What about the unique synergistic revenue growth by cross-marketing to each other's customer base? Perfect. That, in fact, is a perfect definition of an intangible asset. That is a unique synergy that no one else would pay for but one particular person. Can it be supported? Absolutely, it can be supported. So you can see, once again, story one, seemed like a good idea at the time. Story two, we bought it to acquire its portfolio of brands. It's going to help diversify product risk, more attractive to lenders, acquiring an irreplaceable talented workforce that results in competitive efficiencies and lowers costs. Realize unique synergistic revenue growth by cross-marketing to each other's customer base. You can't see a res here, but he's sitting there going, wow, if my client did that, it would be amazing. He's got a giant smile on his face here. Giant smile. Look at this. Hey, look, he likes it. It's, it's good stuff. Okay. So what is your task? You're going to be audited. The starting point is you just bought a company. Make sure you have a story. Begin with the end in mind. That story. Okay, that's going to guide you through the audit process. It's going to help you with the valuation. More importantly, though, and I'm throwing this out for my partner, Guy, there, it's going to help you craft a, a basket of support for those key assumptions driving the value. We'll talk about that in a second. Common judgments. I'm just going to talk about the ones that I deal with all the time. There's a whole bunch of them, of course, useful lives functional currency, convertible notes, et cetera, blah, blah. How about impairment and purchase price allocations? Because really that's, that's what, what, what I do for a living. Let's talk about those. How do you support those? These are the five Ds. Whether it's going to be an assumption or a judgment, it's the same thing. It's a story and the story contains the following components. Number one, document that you even thought about it. Number two, demonstrate that you understand the issue. Here's what we did. Here's the issue. Number three, detail the process that you undertook. Here's the, here's the issue, and this is how we approached it. We considered A, B, and C. To the extent that you're adopting something unique to your industry, describe that, and for an extra bonus point, to make Arez even happier, say, oh, by the way, Arez, Here's what we did. Here's how we understood it. Here's the process. And if you look at this, here's three pieces of paper with respect to other companies doing exactly the same things and arriving at the same decisions. He'd be a happy guy. Lastly, to make the regulators happy, discuss the alternatives considered. This is what we did. This is what we looked at. This is why we didn't choose it. This is why we did choose it. Here's what the impacts would be. That is a nice story. That is a good story. Let's talk a bit about estimates. So those estimates are the things that drive value, okay? Estimates contain estimates of revenue, future revenue. They uh, contain estimates of costs, things like taxes. A big one, working capital. You're going from 1 million in sales to 15 million in sales in the first year. That's really good. How much inventory are you going to need to build up? How much of a working capital injection are you going to have to make? Is it 20% of sales? Is it 10% of sales? Is it material? How are you going to support it? So another thing to make our res even happier, have some support. A lot of sources out there that will say, look at this, five out of six companies have working capital of approximately 10% of revenue. Here you go, Rez, here's five companies. This is how we've supported that assumption. Capital expenditures, you're going from 1 million to 10 million to 20 million. In year two, you're gonna to have to build another factory. Once again, let's look at capacity. Let's have some backup for the cost of the factory. This is all information that you're gonna build along the way to make your auditor a bit happier. But wait, you just paid 20 grand to Mr. CBV who gave you a fancy impairment report. Okay, have you read the fine print? Really? 
Did you really read it? Let's actually take a closer look. Look at it. You can see it. It's upside down. Is that fine here? Oh, well, let me expand it. Here we go. This is what the fine print says, which, by the way, each of my valuation reports contains. Got to love the Americans. Any Americans out there? I know there's probably a couple of you. Anyways, here's the second page of a report prepared by an American valuator. This is what it said. We have not audited, reviewed, or otherwise verified the accuracy or completeness of any of the numbers contained in this report that were provided by management. Oh, so you paid 20 grand and you gave it to Rez and you said, oh, by the way, Rez is smiling again, right? You can't see it. He's got a big smile. Such a handsome guy. Anyways, and Arez is really happy until Arez sees this and says, well, that's great, but the revenue, how's it going from 1 million to 10 million? How are expenses going from 5% down to 3%? How come you need $50,000 of inventory rather than 500,000? Very, very important. Realize that it's up to you, management, to start preparing that portfolio of information that's going to support those key assumptions that are embedded in your assertions. How do you support these estimates? Number one, you document them. Here's the estimate we're going to make. Number two, you're going to demonstrate what they are. <clears throat> this is the first thing that I do. You get a model. It's a complex model. The first thing I want to do is I want to understand how it works. How do you get revenue? Okay, revenue is driven by volume times price. Okay, volume, how are you increasing volume? You're increasing volume from X number of widgets to Y number of widgets. Okay, is there a corresponding increase with marketing expense? Is there a corresponding increase with, with employment expense relating to uh, external consultants, uh, sales consultants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? What about costs? What about all those other factors? Do you understand the model? Is it internally consistent? Very important. Is it common to the industry? Now, quite a few models are very different amongst clients. So to the extent that yours has a, a couple unique wrinkles, make sure you document those and once again, discuss them. Really nail those down. It's gonna make the audit go so much smoother. A good easy one is reference to budgets and forecasts as well. Now, some of you may not have the benefit of that. To the extent that you do, though, this is what happened last year. This is what we budgeted. This is what actually happened. That's going to give a lot of comfort on the audit side. It's easy for management to do. Hand it over to the evaluator. Evaluator then hands it to the audit person. It's a team. Things work great. To the extent you don't have historical, then that's when you really have to go in to explain the, the, the narrative regarding how it works. We're going to sell, our sales are going to go from X to Y because we're going to hire five different salespeople because we're going to open three different stores. Each store is going to require X number of working capital. Here's the competition in each of these areas. Here's our estimated uh, spend on capital expenditures. It's a story. It begins with a story. The wrong story is, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Lastly, you want to have it free of bias. Free of bias. How do you do that? Why don't you throw some sensitivities in there? By the way, a cash flow forecast prepared in the context of financial reporting is not a pitch book. It's not a pitch book. Don't get your director of business development, okay, let's call him Lance, because he's the dude, right? Lance is the dude. He can sell an ice cream, uh, a bucket of ice to an Eskimo, right? He is the dude. Lance, do me a favor. I'm preparing some stuff for, for, for a res here. Can you please work on our forecast? The big hockey stick. Lance is not the guy to prepare it. It's a different thing. It's not a pitch. What it is, is a supportable, well-articulated uh, uh, projection of how you're going to arrive at those particular goals. Very easy to do. Tone it down, include some sensitivities. Okay, it begins and ends with the story. 
Let's have a recap. I've got my notes. Remember, document, you got it. Demonstrate, you got it. Detail, you got it. Describe, you got it. Discuss the alternatives and conclude. Guaranteed, if you do this, you're going to make this dude happy. You're going to make the guy in the back with the mask guy happy. We're all going to be happy. There you go. I think we're going to open up for some questions here. I moved around too much. They told me I couldn't move. That's really hard. <laughs> Anyways, thanks a lot, guys. We're going to open it up for questions. Great. Thanks, Mark. So you certainly woke us up. Uh, which is great. Mark is always has a great personality and uh, a great speaker. So I, I kind of want to take a couple minutes to just do a couple of things before we go into questions. We have a, a little bit of time, uh, just a few housekeeping matters as well. First of all, I kind of want to call up a few people. Um, are you going to be able to see Bahar? Can you see Bahar? Everybody remember Bahar? Hey, Bahar. She has her mask on. Bahar re returned to us just about a month ago after having her second child, and we're super happy to have you back. Yeah, everybody knows Bahar well, and, and so we're, we're getting our marketing programs up and running, and so a lot goes on to this. So nice to see you, Bahar. Nice to see you, too. It's good to be here. Um, Sonia, can you get up here for a second? Just for two seconds, Sonia. I won't embarrass you too badly. You know, people don't get to see us very often anymore, so every once in a while it's okay to say hi. There's Sonia. Hey, Sonia. How you doing? I'm good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hello. Hello. Yeah. It's, it, there's a lot of work in the back. You know, this is one of our first kind of real live big seminar, and there's a lot of work going into the background. Matt, I'm not going to call you up here because if I call you up here, the cameras might get screwed up. So I don't want to do that. Uh, how about Carmen? Can Carmen come up here? Come up here, Carmen. I'm going to ask you a couple questions too from the audience as well. But let me just reintroduce you a little bit. So, Carmen, how long have you been working with us now? Just over ten years. Oh wow! You were you were you, you were uh, you, you were so young back then, and you're still so young now. So Carmen joined our partnership. Uh, it's been about a year now, right? Yes, exactly. And been with us for about yeah. ten years. And uh, uh, another person, Dylan Connolly, who's not here, he's performing some audits right now. Also joined our partnership about a year ago or so. Uh, and both are very long-term people at the firm. So we're super happy to have you as part of our partnership, Carmen, and you're doing a fantastic job so far. And you've already got a couple of questions from the audience as well. Okay, great. Uh, and Carmen performs quite a bit of our significant clients. So, you know, you talked a lot about COVID disclosures and, and you know, you mentioned um, what people did December 2019, which was really just a standard paragraph. And Mike Moret, I'll make a little bit of fun of you and Guy, if I may, but, you know, you, you used to be auditors back in 1999 uh, when Y2K was going on, right? And that's when I began at Davidson and Company in 1999, you know, 21 years ago. And I remember um, seeing a set of financial statements back then, and the year 2000 was about to happen, right? And everybody thought all oh, the computers are going to crash, right? And, and it's going to take all over. And I remember everybody had the same standard paragraph about the effects of Y2K and that it might have a significant impact on our business. And then year 2000 hit and nothing really happened other than a stock market crash. And then we moved on and everybody took out those paragraphs. Now, COVID is a different story. It's hard to compare it to COVID, clearly. And so we find that a lot of clients and, and public companies are really wanting to write stuff about COVID because they feel like they really need to. So the question is, you know, from the audience is that, you know, if I look at an accounting firm and I think about the impact of COVID, or if I think about many other businesses, other than like restaurants and so forth, what should companies do if they really don't know what the impact is or if they really don't have anything? You know, we, um, we tend to go into like how upset we are about people not coming to the office, but what would, if a company really cannot measure the impact of COVID-19, should they disclose anything? I think that if the, if the company really hasn't had any significant changes and you look at your comparison of last year's results to this year, which any financial statement will be looking at your income statement, looking at your expenses, how did they compare, looking at your revenues potentially, if there's really no change, then that's what you would say. You would say that we really haven't experienced any significant changes to date. However, um, we 
as COVID is still ongoing and we don't know when it's going to end, if there is going to be, are we currently in the second wave? How long is it going to last? Then you'd still put that uncertainty of what's to have in the future. I, I think lots of our clients, like if I use mining, for example, some of those um, clients only saw their mine site, for example, if they're in operations shut down maybe for a couple of weeks. So I've seen disclosure where they mentioned that our mine was shut down from this state to this state, but now we're back in full operations. We have no changes and you may have only had that short, very time, small time period where you had that little change in your operations. Okay, yeah, because I mean, I, I don't know if we have an option to raise our hands up, but how many people feel like COVID has had an impact on their lives? Um, you know, I, I would guess every single person in this world is going to put their hand up that they had an impact on their lives. However, when we're talking about financial statement reporting, we're really talking about what impact it had on your financial statement. So while we all would want to disclose lots of things, how COVID is impacting our life, we stick to the financial statements. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Another example would potentially be if you've, uh, you've lowered your amount of personnel, uh, maybe your salaries and wages or your consulting fees may have decreased. Um, likely you're not traveling as much, but those are all not material. If for, for a company, it is material. That is potentially something you can disclose, but if you're not seeing large variances, uh, I would leave it as very minimum disclosure and state that you haven't seen very much change and that you don't know what the future has to hold. Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Carmen. Please feel free to say to Carmen another time and, and please feel reach out to any of us to say hello. Great, thanks. Catherine, can I bug you next? Oh, she's coming back? Okay, Pete, can I bug you next then? Okay, Pete, come on up here. Everybody knows Peter Meloff. Now, now, there was a comment that you've been a partner since 2002. I think it was about 2008, 2009, but you've probably yeah. been with Davidson and Company. Since 96. Oh, since 92, maybe. That's since what it was. 1992. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 84, the partnership was formed, 92. That sounds about right. Okay, so you, you, you've been with us. For, I remember that paragraph you're talking about. The, yeah. The 19, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you've been 19, with Davidson yeah. for about 25 years, huh? Or so. Yeah. I left for about a year and a half. I left for about a year That's, and a uh, half. Yeah. <laughs> you realize that coming back home yeah. is very important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. Yes, okay. I like it here. Yeah, no, so. and, and, we, and we love having you, buddy. Um, so, you, you know, you made, I got two questions on your audience. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. One of them is in cannabis and one of them is in crypto. Two committees that you don't sit on. I know, However, right? you seem to have a great amount of expertise in it, so we're going to okay, ask you well, the question. You can help me with the cannabis. <laughs> So, so you, you, you talked about, about a mother, mother plan, plan. Yeah. yeah, and um, and, and it's quite right. interesting. And again, for those who who just need a bit of reiteration on what a mother plant means, it's a big plant, and you take buds off of it, and then you put seedlings into making new plants. But the mother plant itself is not considered necessarily a cannabis plant. So the question is, have you seen or have you heard how do you value a mother plant? The typically not. I mean, it would be insignificant anyway. You know, uh, so there'd be, a, I mean, you tell me, right? But yeah. uh, that's what I've seen. They have a small room with mother plants. Maybe they have more than one, but maybe they just have one. It's all the clippings that come off it. They're big plants, like you, like yeah. you suggested, yeah. right? So the, the mother plant wouldn't be worth anything anyway, but it's, it's the way they start. It doesn't really start, I think, until you put, maybe not even when you clip it and put it into the pot, but when you put it into the pot that's in the room, that's when you start with the, yeah. uh, with the biological process. Yeah. Well, we, so they're not really valued. Which almost, almost seems counterintuitive yeah. to some degree. Yeah, if you, right? think, if you think about the queen bee, yeah, no. but without it's the queen bee, yeah. none of the bees really matter. Yeah. You don't get a lot of honey. Yeah. And well, so, it's one plant compared to a room with 600 plants. Yeah. You know, that's why it's, it's sure you can have a value and they typically do harvest it maybe when it's done. Right. Uh, but it by itself, it's only one plant. Yeah. And by the way, I'm only sitting, sitting down because I can't stand, stand up and get close to you. Are you okay with yeah, that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I don't mean Sorry, am I, am I leaning in? Up, but that's kind of how it is right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, the, the second, second question, question is regarding right. in the crypto world, and I'm going to read it out. I should, I'm gonna, I should get, <laughs> and I'm going to read it out verbatim because I, I, I don't really understand the terminology, but you probably do. So, what is a trezor, and how is that different from a cold or a hot wallet? Hmm. You know what that means? Yeah, a trezor is a wallet, like okay. it's a wallet, right? Where you store cryptocurrency, and it can be a physical thing, right? Uh, but I think that's it, well, Carmen's here too, right? So a Trezor is a cold wallet, is it not? Yeah. So a hot wallet is something that's that you don't have a you don't have a physical thing for, but it's online. 
So you have to log in to, to, to get your hot wallet. It's always active. So you can crack into your hot wallet, you know, a cold wallet. Once you unplug it from the system, that's it. No one can hack out. I got, I got my, all my Bitcoin right here, right? Nobody can get it, right? The Trezor, right? That's the difference. So Trezor is uh, as a cold wallet. Yeah. So not only myself, but the guy Tom Ass, obviously, he's, yeah, they're all nodding at me. So I must have got it right. <laughs> right. So that, yeah, that's the difference. Uh, uh, I, I love crypto. It's there's a lot of interesting stuff for it. There's a lot of potential. Uh, so keep the questions coming. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Thanks, Speed. Good to see you, man. Yeah, thanks for participating as always. Everybody's thanks. happy to I'm see you. I'm going to get man. another coffee now. Is that right? If you could get me an espresso, <laughs> too, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks, Speed. And then I'm going to call Catherine. Oh, there's Catherine right there. Okay. Great. Come on up, Catherine. It's getting scary. Man. Yeah. No, no. Don't be scared. Uh, so, so many of you know Catherine Tai. Uh, you know, she joined our partnership two years ago now, right? It's your second year. How's it going so far? So far, so good. So far, so that's good. That's the right answer. Yeah, yeah, that's the right answer. And then, and then, Catherine, you've been with us for how long now? Oh, since two thousand and six. Since two thousand and six. So we, you know, we we're very fortunate to, to have Catherine join our partnership. Um, you know, both Catherine, Carmen, Dylan, and Stephen Hawkshaw. I'll talk about him in a second. Uh, you know, we're recent four audit partners that we've made here at the firm, and uh, as you can see, you know, we're looking to continue to grow. Uh, and maintain our, our mark in the footprint of the public markets. Um, so Catherine, uh, a couple questions for you. So you talked about the CAMs, right? The, the changes in the audit report. And, you know, for a lot of clients of ours, when whenever there are changes to the auditing standards or to the audit report, they generally um, believe that it's more our problem than their problem, right? And certainly if there's a change in auditing standard, it just requires us to perform more work. However, this CAM thing, even though it's, um, you know, it's our new requirement, you did mention, and you, you made one particular example about how investors would look at CAMs um, in mar one market uh, versus the other, right? And so one of the questions of the audience came, and, and it might have been an accountant, is there a difference between what you consider a significant risk versus what you would consider to be a key audit matter? Or are those two things the same thing? That's a great question. Um, I, I, I view it as a, and I think a lot of the regulators view it as a funnel approach. And the reason why we want, we want to bring it up uh, in this webinar is that, you know, I see this as a triangle. The process will be a triangle and involve three key parties, the auditor and management and audit committee. Um, and how we will communicate the camps to the audit committee is through our audit committee communications at the planning stage. Um, if you recall, um, you know, clients of ours, we always send you the audit committee letter and we always bug you, please sign it, please sign it. Um, so within that letter, there is a significant risk table. And that's where we identify um, significant risks that we think pertain to your company audit. Uh, for example, if your company is a mining company generating revenue, you have inventory that you extract from an open pit. Um, obviously, there is a significant judgment involved in the valuation of the inventory. So we will start with a significant risk, which you know we may have two or three in the audit committee in the audit committee communications. Revenue recognition will be significant as a as a significant risk, just because it's you know revenue and the cash standard sets. You know, we have to be um, exercising our professional skepticism. So we will include that in a significant risk. But as we um, perform our audit, as the audit progresses, you know, these three significant risks may not be of most significance to the audit. For example, revenue for a mining company, typically it's just one customer. Revenue recognition is pretty straightforward. For that reason, we may not identify that as a, as a key audit matter. And yet it will stay in the um, audit committee communications letter that it is a significant risk. So there is, it is a two-step process. You know, we start with a few matters that we will communicate to the audit committee that these are significant risk. Um, and then we will funnel that through, you know, pick and choose uh, the, the, the ones that are most significant to the audit, the one that involved the most, you know, um, management judgment and the one that 
that we have to put in the most effort. Okay, okay. so it, just because you have a significant risk, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a key audit matter. So there's going to be quite a bit of judgment involved between auditors and management and what to put in the report to some degree. Yes, exactly. Uh, the key audit matter is, is defined as a matter that in our professional judgment, however, we need the input from management, for example, the related uh, disclosure in the financial statements, we will need that input from you. Audit committee, we will need to, to keep you abreast of what matters are, are likely to be, to be camps. Um, the example that I used earlier, you know, your investors may call your investor relations and ask why, you know, I'm comparing two audit reports of two companies operating in the same segment. How come the, the key audit matters identified in these two audit reports are different. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think um, management and audit committee need to have a good understanding of of the process yeah. Yeah. that we go through. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and by the way, I think Europe, a number of other jurisdictions have adopted key audit matters a number of years ago. I know the US okay. has adopted it as well, or they're adopting it this year, I believe, as well. So it's kind of going global, right? This key audit matters thing. And, and, and if clients or companies want to see some examples out there, feel free to reach out to us. Or, uh, of course, you could look at a lot of financial statements that were derived out of Europe and those jurisdictions that already have that in the report. That's right. Okay, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Thanks very much, Catherine. Catherine. Good to Thanks see you. Us. Thank you as well. Okay, who should I pick on next? Justin, can I pick on you? We never pick on you, but Justin is our IT professional. Come up here and say a quick hi, Justin, would you? Just a quick one, Justin. I know I didn't ask you to, like do this before but you know a lot a lot a lot of our um, you know a lot of our computers and you know during covid you can imagine you know all of us went home and started to work right and, and justin really you know kept it cool the whole time right uh, justin you don't need to say anything buddy but this is our it professional justin and, and he, he keeps everything running in the background and, and a lot of times we we just think it's all so simple when everything just works great. Um, so Justin, I just want to say hi, buddy. That's all, man. You want to say anything to the crowd? I'm good. You're good? Okay. <laughs> okay, who should I pick on next? Guy, you're just sitting closer. Mike, I think maybe, we, can we pick on you, Mike? Are we ready to pick on Mike Moreto a little bit? I don't mean that in any, in any negative way whatsoever. Mike, thanks very much, of course, for always joining us. We totally, um, we totally resonate with some of the comments you made about the interaction of people and the hope that next year we can do this in person. And, uh, you know, a lot of the reasons why, you know, we're choosing to continue to do these is because we don't want to lose momentum. Uh, we know there will be a time again where we're going to be able to interact. We know there will be a time again where we can have a beer and laugh it all off. I don't know for sure if it's going to be next year. I hope it's going to be next year. But if it's not, maybe two years maximum, and, and hopefully in a few years we can all reflect back and grow from it, and, and, and it, as you said, reintroduce each other to each other. And I thought that was a really, really good way. So the, the first, the first question from the audience, Mike, and, and I have to ask you this because, how does your family like your new beard? Uh, they do not. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. I, I also grew a beard. I also grew a beard during this time myself. Um, you know, I, I have mixed messages from my kids. Depends on how uh, how prickly it is. Uh, if I kiss one of my kids or my wife, they tend to be a bit scratchy. So I get that comment. But in general, they're okay with it. So I was told to get rid of it, but um, we had a planning meeting by Zoom last week, and yeah, you, had, yeah. you had your beard, and I. I told him it was out of solidarity that I, I keep mine or otherwise you're the lone wolf in the room. I appreciate so, I personally think uh, it looks very good. I, mean, like, I just want you to run. No matter what they tell you, your family, I think you look good in it. So I'll allow you to decide. I, I'm in the basement and the next step is I'm in the garage. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Are you going to keep it or you don't know what you're going to do? Oh, it's going to go by, by, by soon. It's going to go by, by soon. Okay. Yeah. So look, there, there's one, one question from the audience that they kind of wanted to understand about process. I mean, as we, as we move to the online world and there's a lot more correspondence by email, we get a lot of questions on how to handle comment letters. Okay. And, and, you know, typically um, there's a law firm involved and, and they'll often, um, you know, help guide the issuer about how to respond to questions. But we get a lot of questions from our issuers. Is it okay to pick up the phone um, and clarify questions on a comment letter? Is there, Absolutely. You know, any sort of, any, because a lot of issues are afraid to do that um, or, or they don't know how to ask the question. But from your experience, how, what kind of thoughts you can share about the comment letter process? You know, I, I would suggest reach out, but, but maybe let your uh, advisors know you're reaching out. So sometimes we'll, you know, everything is by letter, goes electronic, so yeah. pretty you know, that hasn't really been impacted. 
get posted on CDAR, responses come back. We typically deal with the uh, the lawyer or, or whoever's dealing with it on, on an advisory basis. But for an issuer to call up, absolutely. I say that I think the only thing is, is, you know, I would suggest is, is looping in your, your advisors, whether it's your auditor or your lawyer, just so that when things are discussed and if things are agreed upon, yeah. that everyone's in the room. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're always um, open to conversations, you know, because I think what I always say to my staff is don't assume that they understand where you're coming from if you're giving a very detailed thing, because what you may be after is different disclosure and the issuer might be thinking, well, look, I got this comment letter that says, well, the way I've done it is wrong. What do I do now? So, no, maybe the thing is we didn't understand the, 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 the reason for which you took that position. So yeah, reaching out is, is a good thing. And, um, you know, I think for those in this room, we've had the conversation sometimes and they sometimes start out being awkward. It's like, seems like you guys are really against the way the issuers treated this. Yeah. And it might be that in fact, the disclosure there is just not complete and having more of a picture. So any, any back and forth we think is valuable. Uh, no, the, 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 only, the only caveat sometimes is that I find that if issuers call up and say, oh yeah, I agree to that and you know, whatever. And then the, the you know, the lawyer, the auditor kind of says, well, that's, you, you're okay to take that position, but that's inconsistent with what you told us. So now we're kind of saying which story which story is correct. Right. So, yeah, no, that, that, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's good, good sense, sense Mike. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. And then this, the second question, maybe you could answer it, and Guy, I want to get to you, and then we'll wrap it up as well. Um, there was a question about business versus assets, and what is the what is the commission looking for from issuers when they are making that assessment? Uh, whether it's, you know, obviously the criteria for business versus an asset. Are you looking for anything particular, or is it, is it generally left to the advisors to assess? Any comments there? Um, generally left to the advisors. What I would say is in particular, this issue kind of, it goes in waves yeah. right now. Yeah. Obviously the mining space is very active. So we're, we're seeing a lot of that. So, yeah. you know, the idea is, is it a business, is it an asset? It's, it's, it's subjective. And especially when you look at the difference between IFRS and securities legislation. So IFRS is easy. Is it in three or is it not? Right. Uh, securities legislation we have, uh, what some would say is wishy-washy language, which says, if you uh, generally buy um, shares of a company, you've bought uh, a business. Yeah. So I would say that that's kind of your starting point. And then think about from our perspective, and th this is probably a great example of why reaching out is is beneficial because, you know, it may be that we agree that it is a business for securities legislation purposes, but what we're really after is not that much different than what you have in your financial statements. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really kind of getting to that, to, to be on the same level of, and not think that this is in any way a trick question. Okay, we agree that it's a business, yeah. now what? Yeah. It's really having that conversation, okay, the commission says generally when you buy shares, it's it's a business. Okay, what is that? what does that now entail as the second step? So having that conversation probably is, is a big benefit. But again, everyone in the room, because we see it day in, day out, where they say, well, look, I bought the shares of this company and it has a mining asset somewhere, and but it's not really a business and there's no financials. So, okay, but, you know, what I always say is, let's get past about, you know, um, argue about whether it's a business or not, and let's kind of think about what we want for the disclosure yeah. and then come back to the, okay, well, you can see why we think it's a business under securities legislation, but we, we agree on the path forward. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the takeaway is, you know, the securities commission does have a system where, you know, if you need to clarify anything, there's a mechanism to do that. Uh, we want you to know, Mike, that, you know, from our, our perspective, from a lot of our clients, the securities commission, um, really took a proactive role in trying to accommodate reporting issues this year, yeah. not, not just, just with the extensions, extensions with management C straight orders, and, and we believe the Securities Commission has really helped kind of a lot of public companies get through this stuff. So yeah. thanks again, Mike, for, uh, for joining us again. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that comment because, um, you know, day in, day out, I mean, I say to my staff, we, we often hear the phrase, we're all in the same boat, 
And I actually throw it back to people and say, well, we're not actually all in the same boat, but we're in the same storm. We're in different boats. <laughs> and and it, whether it's issuers, whether yeah, it's individuals, yeah, I think yeah. we got to recognize that everyone's kind of, everyone's in the same storm, but in different positions. So yeah, yeah, we yeah. really kind of going to, that's always resonated with me when I've heard that statement that, you know, because every every day I was come on, we're all in the same boat. I'm like, no, I don't think we are. But anyway, thank right you, Mike, to Arez, right and Mike. thanks to Davidson. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks so much. much. And last, last but not least, least, Mr. Thomas, can you get up here? I'll pick on you for a minute or two, and then we'll, we're still, we're still going to do a draw. draw and just last couple of housekeeping house items. Am I allowed to go a couple minutes over? Okay, I'll go a couple. Whoever needs to log out, they can do so. I'm going to do a draw for some Starbucks cards, and then a couple housekeeping things as we go towards the Christmas season. So, guys, just a couple. Just maybe I'll. I'll um, maybe just stick to one question because I quite liked it. Um, and, and I don't know if there's an answer to it, but we're going to ask it. So when it comes down to materiality, um, you know, there's the audit definition, which we calculate that based on a bunch of parameters. Sometimes others have different definitions for it. Have you seen or do you know whether regulators or others, how do they view materiality versus how we view it? Ours is uh, pretty much a calculated and more precise number, if we can call it that. It's still uh, based on what we would call our judgment. Yeah. So similar to other uh, other groups or, or entities, whatever, they their definition of materiality will also be based on judgment and not necessarily the same numeric criteria. Um, and some some judgment is very limited in terms of uh, requirements. So, for instance, uh, if you've got a related party transaction, while well, that's that's purely disclosure, regardless of materiality. Um, where, but but I think that one's all all going to be specific judgment to the company as to what or or a regulator as to what they will think is uh, is material in their context. What is the real question is what is meaningful to the reader. In our context, uh, if there's any kind of a, an error, what, what, how big an impact do we think that would have on the reader? And so that kind of judgment will be similar, I think, in a company process. Great. And everybody knows Guy Thomas. Guy, I think you and I have been at the firm around the same time, uh, about 20 or so years, right? And uh, Guy sits on quite a few committees now across the country and is just a great source for uh, to know what's going on in the marketplace and update. Uh, very fortunate, Guy, to have you here as always today. And looking forward to a great future together as well. Thanks, Mr. D. Thank you. Yeah, Guy usually dresses on Halloween um, this quite is, a bit. This is my new as Halloween outfit. As many of you have today. seen. And I, I don't know, are you doing anything? I, I know in your neighborhood, you guys always have a big block party every year. Is there anything going on this year or is nothing going on? This is one of these unfortunate years. Uh, in the past, we've had for the past several years, over a thousand children come by our place and it's shoulder to shoulder uh, throughout the whole neighborhood. And so sadly, yeah. uh, this year we've said uh, to be responsible adults that we think we are, we cannot uh, uh, open our street up to that this year. Um, and so in lieu of that, and I'll say this very quietly, um, we are going to provide uh, the, the kids on our street with a particular access to, to Halloween treats and dress up and so forth. But uh, unfortunately, I think uh, just to be responsible, no, uh, we're shut down for Halloween on Saturday, sadly. But hey, sadly. you're doing something, something small, small to keep it up. You know? Got it. Because if you don't do anything next year, it's something loses a bit. So anyways, guys, thanks very much. Mr. Thank you. Steve, great to have you. So, you know, just a couple of last housekeeping things. As, as many of you know, at Davidson and Company, normally at this time of the year, we gear up towards Christmas time and we throw our client appreciation parties and lots of other things. We can't quite do that this year uh, as much as we wish we would. And we really, 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 really wish we could, uh, but, but we can't. And so look ahead to next year. Um, you know, I'm sitting here on the 14th floor of our firm. It's additional space that we took on recently. And, and next time we'll give you a bit of a tour and we, can't wait to have you all up here uh, and have a beer or two with us uh, when we do this next time. If you got any further questions or any comments, uh, send it to events at davidson-co.com. Uh, there's going to be a survey and PD certificate emailed to you later this week. Um, always check our website, right, Bahar, for any upcoming seminars um, and upcoming events that we do. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all the speakers who have participated today, even though it's a bit of a different year than any other year. And I'm gonna, just going to do a quick draw. I'm going to do, do three of them. 
Um, I'm sure everybody likes to drink Starbucks. There's a really nice Starbucks down on Pender and Granville. They sell their um, uh, fancy um, espresso. So if you come downtown every once in a while and you feel like getting away from your house and having a coffee with us, uh, we'll invite you for a coffee um, on your gift card. So the first name that's going to get a, a Starbucks gift from, for us is Dan Martino. That's a great coincidence. Dan, I don't know if you're out there. Um, I hope you are, but great to pick your name. Dan worked with us for a long time and is now a client as well. And he's got two young children as well. And so it's great to see him. And then the next person that's going to get a hundred bucks gift card is Frederick Davidson. I don't think that's uh, Bill's brother, but similar last name. I think you're from Impact Silver, but I'm not 100% sure. So we'll send you a gift certificate for Starbucks coffee. And last but not least, Elizabeth Tello. And forgive me if I mispronounce that. So I hope you are there. Uh, if you are not there, we will find you and then we will mail it to you. Uh, so just lastly, again, I'd like to thank everybody. We just want everybody to know that at Davidson & Company, uh, we are here, uh, even though somewhat remotely, our firm, as you can see, has new partners. We are looking to continue to grow, and we're looking to continue to serve the public markets. And it doesn't matter to us if you're a big company or if you're a small company. You're always welcome at Davidson & Company, and we want you all to know that. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to sign off. And that's it, everybody. Talk to you soon and give us a call.